I now want to wel welcome our next speaker. It's Professor Peter Moss. Peter is Emeritus Professor of Early Childhood Provision at UCL Institute of Education in London. He's researched and written on many subjects, including early childhood education, the relationship between employment, care and gender, and democracy in education. And much of his work has been cross-national, and he's led a European Commission network on childcare and an international network on parental leave. And I know he's very, very familiar with, with what's happening across the world. So Peter's going to be speaking about the system that we need now and how we're going to achieve it. So Peter, we welcome you to Scotland, well, virtually to Scotland. <laughs> Thank you very much for that introduction, Janet. Indeed, I wish I was in Edinburgh today rather than sitting in a rather gray and very soggy London. Next, next slide, please. I, I want to build on the earlier presentations by Joanna Inez Dottier and Ava Lloyd to make an argument in three parts about early childhood systems. I want to start by analysing the state we are in, and by we I mean the Anglophone world, in which I include Scotland, for the Anglophone countries have very similar early year systems. And I shall conclude that there is a need for transformative change in these systems. I'll then propose the system that I think we need, but I want to say that I'm offering one perspective on transformative change and others are indeed available. And thirdly, I will outline how to achieve a transformed system. Now, this will be a very brief and rough guide to a critical and complex issue. Ne next slide, please. So part one, the state we're in. Uh, next slide, please. So my general analysis of the state we're in is that the early childhood services in the Anglosphere, and that again includes Scotland, share a common model with deep-seated problems. And this is a model that I term childcare predominant split system. I'll explain what I mean by that in a minute. With the partial exception of New Zealand, which is a very important exception, the Anglosphere countries have failed to diagnose the problems with this model and to specify an adequate solution to these problems. So my third part of my analysis is that tweaking the existing model is totally inadequate. We won't get anywhere by, again, rearranging the deck chairs, nothing short of transformative change is now needed. So let me develop this analysis. The next slide, please. Across the world, early childhood systems are split between, on the one hand, what we might call childcare, and on the other hand, what we might loosely call school or kindergarten services. These split systems are very widespread and uh, every country I think starts in this way. Now a few countries, and these are mostly the Nordic countries as we've heard from Joanna, have fixed this problem and they have made the move to a fully integrated education-based early childhood system running from birth to six or indeed seven. So basically these few countries have bid farewell to separate childcare services. But most countries remain split. And within those split countries, there are two kind of models we can see. If you look, for example, to continental Europe, you will see a split system where schools or kindergartens predominate. And France is a very good example of this. In France, you have full-time universal education for three to six-year-olds, three-year age group, plus some two-year-olds in what they call école maternelle, essentially nursery schools. But in the Anglosphere, the childcare services, childcare services predominate in this split system. Next slide, please. So these childcare predominant split systems consist in practice of two parts. And I think this will be familiar to you in Scotland as it is to me in England. 
On the one hand, in the majority, you have childcare services. These are mainly private services, such as nurseries and childminders, and they sell care to working parents for, ch uh, for children from zero to five, plus in recent years, they've added some educative functions. In these services, parents pay, but increasingly over the last decade or two, there have been increasing public subsidies, often paid to parents. And finally, the, in these services, we find workforces which have low qualifications and low pay. If we turn to the other part of the split system, the school services, these are public services providing education for children over three years. They're publicly funded with no cost to parents. And the workforce in these school services is relatively well qualified and well paid. Next slide, please. Now, the negative consequences of split systems, whether they're school predominant or childcare predominant, have been long recognised and written about. I've put a few of these up on my uh, slide. <clears throat> so you get separate, mainly private, uh, you have a separate, mainly private childcare sector, which is based on a low cost employment model, but often charges high, high cost to parents. You get fragmented, incoherent, and socially divisive services. If, if you go and look at OECD's family database, for example, you will find that childcare services are used more by more advantaged children. Certainly for children under three, this applies. You find that these systems embed the artificial distinction between care and education and undermine children's right to education beginning at birth. And I'm quoting here from the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child. And last but not least, these split systems lead to a weak early childhood sector. And this is especially true where the sector ends at the early age of five, as it does in Scotland and England. And this leads to schoolification, or what Joanna called push down, which OECD has defined as primary schooling taking over early childhood institutions in a colonizing manner. Next slide, please. And there's one other split in early childhood systems, apart from that between childcare and schools, it should be noted, and that is between early childhood services and a point Ava raised in her presentation, leave policies. And what this leads to in nearly all countries, apart from the Nordic countries again, is a large gap between the end of well-paid maternity and parental leave on the one hand, and the start of universal entitlements to early childhood services on the other. In the United Kingdom, that gap is 33 months between the end of the short period of well-paid maternity leave we offer and the start of universal entitlements to early childhood at the age of three. And I noted here on this slide that both leave policy and parental childcare subsidies like tax-free childcare are UK government responsibilities and not yet devolved to the four nations of the UK. And I'll return to that issue later on because I think it's important. Next slide, please. So let me turn to the system I think that we need. Next slide, please. And I want to focus today on transformative change of the early childhood system. But I think that needs to be accompanied by transformation in other areas, for example, in values and ethics. I have argued, uh, for example, that early childhood education should have democracy as a fundamental value, as indeed we heard Joanna talk about. We find that in the Nordic countries already. And I've also argued that our early childhood education system should be inscribed with an ethics of care. I've also written and uh, been inspired by people who've talked about different approaches to pedagogy. For example, early childhood education working with a slow pedagogy. And here we are uh, benefiting from very important work being done by Alison Clark, much of it in Scotland. 
But I've also been inspired myself by Reggio Emilia's work on what they call a pedagogy of relationships and listening. But there is no time today, obviously, to go further into values, ethics and pedagogy, but they should not be lost from the agenda. Next slide, please. So, as I said at the beginning, I want to offer one perspective on transformative system change. And as I want, always want to emphasize, other perspectives are available. Uh, there are always alternatives. In my, in, in my view, transformation means turning away from a childcare dominated split system towards a fully integrated and public system of early childhood education from birth to six years. And that I would base on a number of principles. First of all, the image of the rich child born with a hundred languages and as a citizen with rights. Can I have the next slide, please? In starting with the image of the child, I am following the great Italian educator, Loris Malaguzzi, who wrote, a declaration about the image of the child is not only a necessary act of clarity and correctness, it is the necessary premise for any pedagogical theory and any pedagogical project. I also follow Loris Malaguzzi in his choice of the image of what he called the rich child. Again, I quote from him. We say all children are rich. There are no poor children. All children, whatever their culture, whatever their lives, are rich, better equipped, more talented, stronger and more intelligent than we can suppose. They are not bearers of needs, but bearers of rights, values and competencies. Can you go back one slide, please? So that's the first principle of a fully integrated and public system of early childhood education, an image of the rich child. The second principle would be children's rights, in particular, their right to an education from birth, as specified and discussed by the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child. The third principle is recognising early childhood education as a public good. And that, in my view, means that we need to demarketize and deprivatize the early childhood system. And my final principle would be to understand early childhood education as an essential part of the welfare state and of social infrastructure. In other words, it's recognition as a universal basic service. Can you go forward two slides, please? Thank you. So, a fully integrated and public system of early childhood education means a number of things. First of all, integrated access. It means an entitlement for all children and their carers from birth to six years, and built into that is 12 months of well-paid parental leave. So in other words, there should be no gap between the end of well-paid parental leave at around a year and the start of accessing early childhood services. The second aspect of this system is integrated provision. We should be moving, I think, to multi-purpose community services for children from zero to six and their families. An example that comes from my own country, England, is children's centres, but I'm sure you have similar examples of multi-purpose community-based services in Scotland. And this integrated provision should be made by local authorities or non-profit organisations having agreements with local authorities. That is to emphasise the public aspect of the system. The third feature of the system should be an integrated workforce. And that workforce should be based on a graduate early childhood worker. That is a worker specialising in work with children from zero to six 
a professional worker, should either be a teacher or could be a social pedagogue. There are different models we could build on. And this graduate specialist worker should have parity with primary teachers. And last but not least, there should be integrated funding. Services should be funded directly. There should be no more subsidies to parents and they should be free to attend for a core period. Similar, in other words, to primary and secondary schools. And I want to say before I move on that my emphasis on six is quite deliberate because it seems to me that the starting children as we do in England and Scotland at primary school at five is too early and it is time that we actually took the step of moving towards six as the stage, at the age to start school. Next slide, please. So a fully integrated and public system of early childhood education means being part of the education system with education at the heart of the early childhood system because education is a child's right from birth and based on a holistic concept of education. But it also means supporting parents at home in the first year while taking well-paid parental leave. So this means parents at home with their infants should have access to those multi-purpose services that I've mentioned. It means early childhood education serving many other purposes, including supporting employed parents. So it's education plus, 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 plus. And it also means early childhood education recognising the importance of care for all children and all adults. For me, care means a relational ethic, an ethic of care, it is not a commodity for sale to certain parents who are in the labour market. So next slide. So to summarise, this is an early childhood education system inscribed with an ethic of care. We don't need to talk about early childhood education and care because care should be inherent in all education systems. It's an early childhood education system that is inclusive and multi-purpose, serving all children and all families together. It is an early childhood system with no separate childcare services, and it is an early childhood education system that is treated as the first stage of the education system running from birth to six years and in a strong and equal partnership with compulsory education. Next slide. To understand what a fully integrated public system looks like, I think it's quite interesting to take the case of Sweden. So there you have administration and regulation of the whole early childhood system in education. You have a single curriculum, the curriculum for the preschool for children from one to six. You have a universal entitlement to an early childhood service from 12 months of age for all children, whether their parents work or not, whether they are coming from a, a lower income family or not. And there is no gap between the end of well-paid leave and the start of that early childhood entitlement. You have an integrated single type of provision, what they call preschools, centers for all children from one to six. These are legally defined as schools and have long opening hours to accommodate parents who are employed. You have an integrated workforce with a graduate based on a graduate early years teacher who specializes in working with children from one to seven. And you have an integrated funding system which funds services directly and from taxes with a free period for three to six year olds and a maximum fee for the remaining period set at a low level. It's worth pointing out that Sweden spends 1.6% of its GDP on early childhood education compared to the UK, which spends less than half of that, 0.6%. So we obviously have some way to go. Could you move on two slides, please? And one more. So finally, how to achieve a transformed system that really deserves a whole seminar in itself. Next slide, please. I think there is a need to start with critical thinking. We need to start by working on what we really want and why we want it and how. 
I think it's significant that the Swedes, whose example I've just given, um, actually grew their system out of a four-year commission, which, and I quote from a senior Swedish civil servant, mobilized expertise from every corner of the country. The it was the foundation ideologically, pedagogically, and organizationally for the full-scale expansion that followed. For example, out of this commission, they moved to integrate what had been separate daycare centers and separate kindergartens into an integrated service. And they also integrated their workforce. And they also adopted a particular approach to pedagogy, what they call dialogue pedagogy. Another example would be New Zealand, which is a very innovative example of uh, transformation. And in 1988, they set up an early childhood care and education working group, which published a very significant report called Education to be More, which led, amongst other things, to the establishment of a graduate early childhood teacher. And today, nearly three quarters of the workforce in New Zealand is made up of graduates, special, specialist graduate teachers who specialise in early childhood work. It also led to the innovative 05 curriculum Tohoriki that we've heard about. Next slide, please. Having set out the direction of travel, there needs to be a timetable and mechanism for trans transition. For example, the Scottish government would need to commit to an integrated public system of early childhood education and set a suitable transition period. I think it needs to negotiate that all funding and leave policy is devolved to the Scottish government from the UK government. I think it needs to move from, a, from demand funding of childcare services, that is like tax, uh, tax credits and tax relief and so forth, to 100% supply funding of a public system of early childhood education and use funding to leverage change towards a public system. It would need to support existing workers in childcare and teaching so that they can upgrade their qualifications to the new specialist early childhood teacher. And last but not least, open dialogue with potential friends such as in New Zealand and in the Nordic countries. I would say that transition and change should not be done alone. Final slide, please. So is it too late for transformation? I fear the Anglosphere countries have generally wasted decades failing to address problems and allowing them only to get worse. They tended to be in holes and kept digging. But perhaps Scotland on the margins of the Anglosphere, looking across the North Sea to the Nordic world, has the best chance to transform. I shall be watching with interest. And sorry, there is one more slide which is my email, and I would be very pleased to uh, exchange with anybody who wants to get in touch with me after this uh, event. Thank you very much for your time. Well, thank you, thank you thank very you much, much, Gita. Gita. Uh, I, I think you've raised an awful lot of issues. There's, there's a challenge in Scotland. We have a lot less private uh, provision of childcare centres, but your point about them being integrated uh, and there being a, a coherent system from zero to six is a really, really interesting one. Uh, th there's a question I'd like to ask you. When you talk about a curriculum for zero to six, what, what, are, you, what are you meaning by that? Because the, the, the definition of a, a zero curriculum is, is a challenge. Yeah, um, I should just say, by the way, that from, from my uh, look reading of the Care Inspectorate's early learning and childcare statistics, more than half of your early years provision is private, and probably half at least of that is for profit. So, although Scotland is, is less um, given over, shall we say, to for profit provision than in England, it's still a uh, fits into this model of being predominantly childcare and just predominantly private. Um, I think the curriculum, I think in most countries that have moved um, their services into education, you have in Scotland moved all early childhood into the responsibility of your education ministry. M most, if not all of those countries, apart from Scotland, have moved to uh, 
if you like, a zero to five or six curriculum. In other words, a curriculum covering children that covers both children under three and over three. And Scotland is rather unusual in your curriculum, as I understand it, starting at three and moving up through uh, the compulsory school system. So I just come back from uh, Sweden, where I was last week, where, as I said, their curriculum is actually covers children from one because hardly any Swedish children are in um, early year services under one because of their uh, parental leave provision. And that's true of most of the Nordic countries, I would think. So probably I would be more accurate to say a curriculum for children from one to five or six. OK, OK, I, I think that that's that's really, really interesting. And I suppose the, the other the other question I've got for you is um, you talk about an integrated service. Is that an integrated service physically or is it um, from a management perspective? Oh, yes. So in other words, uh, the, the idea of having separate early learning centres versus having an early learning centre adjacent to, say, a primary school. No, I, I think I think this is a trouble we, we uh, and not just just Scotland, we endlessly tweak and rearrange the system instead of grasping the, uh, the, the nettle, so to speak, and actually make uh, a proper change. I, am, I think we need to move to zero to six centres. I, I would call them schools, but you, there are different names for them, kindergartens, preschools, children's centres. And I think these need to be separate, but in close and equal relationship with primary schools and secondary schools. I think there is a real problem of digging out early childhood from its subsidiary situ situation in the education system and this process of schoolification or push down, which is very apparent, I'm afraid, throughout the world. I mean, I think it's quite uh, striking that quite a number of countries in Europe are now moving to make early years compulsory. So in France, which I mentioned now, from three, it is compulsory to attend nursery school. So I think that I think there are it is really quite important to actually build up the zero to six sector as a distinct se sector with its own identity and its own contribution to make to the education system. OK, well, that's that's very good. And I, I, you, you also made the comment that the, the, the those centres should not just be for children, but should be for families and have oh, yes. right decisions. Uh, and and, and you know, I, th I think this is true of schools as well. Uh, I mean, I think we have to rethink not only early years, but the whole school system. I think the COVID epidemic has just brought home that schools have this enormous potential to be actually hubs for families, for communities, etc. I think um, schools and, and early childhood centres have infinite projects that they can conduct. I, I go back to Joanna's point about democracy. For me, for example, I would see early childhood centres and schools as being places where we renew democracy. I, John Dewey says democracy needs to be renewed in every generation and schools should be the midwives. Well, I would extend that to early childhood. And there are so many other functions they can serve. So, yes, that would be my, my view very much. Families, communities, multi multi generational centers doing lots of things okay thank you very much thank you very much peter